question lane. Solving problems through the process of questions and answers. This question I want to get into uh, the portion of the book uh, about the Newberry lynching. Mm -hmm. Stella Young. Mm -hmm. Who was Stella Young and uh, why was her lynching especially heinous? Stella Young was the uh, wife of um, um, a man who uh, was believed um, to be heading up a gang of black hog thieves. And um, Boise, uh, what was Boise's last name? I forget Boise's name at the moment. Um, Yeah, just check, uh, check it out for me. But Stella was the husband of a black man who was seen as the head of a uppity group of of um, of hog thieves, and um, the uh, the um, white folks in Newberry, Florida, uh, uh, became concerned about this gang of alleged hog thieves, and a white constable went out to Boise's house to arrest him. Actually, two white men went three actually, and uh, Bo Boise uh, ended up shooting uh, this white constable. And that set off this, uh, this chase in, uh, in, uh, in Electra County where Newberry is located to find Boise. Boise Long might have been his name. Yeah, Boise Long, that's what it was. Boise, Boise Long. Long. Yeah. Um, this mob gathered uh, to track him down. Uh, he managed to escape uh, being captured for a while. But his relatives were rounded up, including his wife, who was pregnant at the time, Stella Young. She just kept her name. She didn't take Boise's name. And uh, St Stella and uh, five or six other blacks were taken to the Alachua County Jail, the Newberry Jail, excuse me, where they were taken immediately by a mob to the outskirts of Newberry to what was called the Hanging Tree, which was an enormous oak tree, incredible uh, tree. Uh, with massive limbs that had been used uh, as a lynching site for years in Newberry. And they took uh, these people out and hung them all together, including Stella Young. When she dropped, her neck was broken and she was heavily pregnant. Uh, the child uh, was expelled at the time that she was lynched. Uh, the baby was caught by a white woman who was attending this lynching and uh, given to a relative of the Long family who raised this boy. Um, and then after the lynching, the bodies were eventually cut down, stacked like cordwood, and Stella Young's body, her corpse, was placed beneath that of the male victims. And I have a photograph that I found in Jacksonville in Duval County Library years ago uh, of these, this pile of bodies. And I took a very close undercover in my book, in fact. And once I scanned in on this, this photograph, I noticed a woman's face beneath the others. And that was Stella Young. These people who had committed this lynching, which was the largest mass lynching in Florida history, took place in 1916, uh, were apparently ashamed that they'd lynched a woman and tried to hide Stella Young's body beneath that of the other lynch victims. Um, but that's what happened in Newberry. It was all over alleged, uh, the alleged uh, stealing of hogs that then exploded when this constable was killed uh, by Boise Law. Boise, Boise did shoot him. Uh, there was no mistake about that. Uh, but that was the largest lynching in Florida history. And that lynching tree, I went to Newberry several times uh, doing research. A black man who uh, eventually became a county commissioner and a uh, city commissioner in Newberry told me that that tree had been cut down back in the 1950s, uh, but that for over 100 years that tree stood uh, as the place where they lynched black people. Interesting. And yeah, very tragic. At, at this stage in my life, I try to. Uh, I'm sorry, can I tell you one other thing about the, the Newberry lynchings? Because I talked no, to sure. a black lady who. Uh, the place where they lynched these people is called, still is called Lynch Hammock. It's right outside of the city of Newberry, Highway 26 going into. Newberry out of Jane Gainesville, you run into Newberry. Can you repeat that name again? Lynch, 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 Lynch Hammock. Lynch Hammock. Okay. It's a very large, a lot of large oak trees still there today, so it's a very dark place. 
So even in August, it's cool in Lynch Hammock. And I used to sit there and have a beer thinking about what had happened there. But a black woman uh, who owns a part of that property, uh, she's an undertaker, uh, let me roam the property with her. And she said she didn't know that that was where the lynching tree was when she uh, purchased the property. Uh, but they say the, she was told by people who were alive at the time that when Stella's body fell and she was lynched, that the moon came out and it was like the sun had come out and it scared the white people and they ran away. She said, Dr. Dunn, today if you come out here uh, on a full moon, it's like the sun is out, just like it was that night they killed these people. She says it's very scary to be here on a, fu uh, on a full moon night. So it's almost like an ominous reminder of uh, the incorrect behavior that happened on that night. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. At this stage in my life, I try to do my best to uh, avoid name calling and uh, uh, mistreating to the best of my ability fellow non-white people. Because as I continuously said uh, in, in this interview, uh, we are all victims of white supremacy. Which we got to wrap up pretty soon. That's right. So that's right. The other main ones you want to ask me about, you better get to it. We're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. Uh, Burley Jones. Who was Burley Jones? And what oh, was, my God. And, and what, what was Burley Jones' uh, role in the in a, Okoe? In the Okoe riot. Burley Jones was a former slave. He lived in Okoe, Florida. Okoe is very close to Orlando. It's in Orange County. In 1920, a major lynching took place there. The town, the black, the part of the black section was burned down. Um, but um, Burley Jones was the black man who was the essence of what it means to be an Uncle Tom. Uh, when two black men tried to vote in the 1920 election, July Perry being one of them, Moe Norman being the other one, and the rumor got started that because they were rejected from the polls that they had gone and, and, uh, and armed themselves and got other blacks to the, their house, to, to uh, July Perry's house, to defend themselves against whites who were going to come to question what they were doing at the polls. Uh, this rumor that these blacks were arming themselves uh, was perpetuated among a small group of whites until Burley Jones told his ex-boss man, his ex, the family that owned him, that it was true. So now whites had the verification from a black man that July, that July Perry and others were armed inside July Perry's house with intent of confronting any whites who came there. So. He, he was the one that, in a sense, helped to set this this uh, this this event off. And then once the riot was all over and blacks left Okoye, there were no black people left in Okoye except one man. And Bur who was that man? That was Burley Jones. Burley Jones stayed in, in Okoye until he was, it got so old that they the white folks got some money together and put him in a nursing home. And it wasn't until the 1970s that blacks began to go back to Okoye. Wow. So. Uh... Being Uncle Tom kind of pays off, right? Burley Jones was not the only Uncle Tom who got some benefit from being an Uncle Tom. There were mm -hmm. many, many instances of black resistance that was tipped off by, by black folks who told. Mm. All right, I got, I got three more questions to wrap it up. Uh, earlier we talked about uh, the role that white men, white women, and white children play in uh, racism. Uh, what, what, if you could recall, there was an 11-year-old girl who uh, spoke about the Okoe riots to a newspaper. Uh, do you recall what she said and her comments were? Her comments was, uh, all the fun we had when some niggers burned up. Oh yeah. That, does that sound like a, a ignorant person? No, it sounds like a child who was subject to the uh, anti-black views and racism that was endemic in her family. Uh, and she reflected what was a, a pretty common attitude among some whites who attended lynchings, which was that it was an event to be celebrated. It was a, an event to have some sort of a public uh, gathering so that people could witness this. Okay. And to get back on snitching, this is uh, two more questions left. To get back on snitching, uh, who do you think... Uh, endears the concept and, and practices the concept of not snitching the most? White people or non-white people? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I'm asking in the context of, because uh, on page 118, we talked about, uh, uh, not 118, we talked, uh, 
there, there was an incident where uh, male, uh, a lot of white male witnesses saw uh, Brian Hudson shoot Sam Carter. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, I still hear you going. Nobody, you nobody going. told in mm-hmm. that situation. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, to quote you, it, it, you described it as it was typical of the era. That's right. It was white folks didn't talk. You're right. You're right. That's why that's that's why lynchings were so rarely brought to any sort of uh, legal uh, response. Even though in many instances that people had talked to, nothing would have happened. But yes, that one reason that anti-black violence was so rampant and so infrequently pursued legally was because folks kept their mouths shut. But that was because it was their sons, their husbands their brothers, their cousins out there doing the lynching. So, you know, very few white people actually participated in the lynchings in terms of actually being there to commit the murders. Um, But almost everybody kept their mouths shut. And that is what gave license to lynch parties. White people don't snitch. We, I didn't say that. No, but you see, we, like, you just, just... That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Let's, 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 let's not quote Dr. Dunn. That's what I'm saying. White people don't snitch. Black people don't snitch. They didn't snitch then. Yeah. yeah. But uh, all right. on page 118, you describe an example of uh, whites who uh, help blacks. Uh, and this is relating to the Rosewood incident. For mm-hmm. example, the Bryce uh, brothers, James and Creighton, mm-hmm. uh, during the Rosewood massacre, they allowed uh, some black people. Uh, uh, They're on the train. They allowed black used. people sanctuary on the train. But there was a caveat to that. That was... Uh, Black women and children, uh, because uh, you stated that the white mob's target were men and older boys. Mm-hmm. What age do you think constitutes uh, a black male being viewed as an older boy? Thirteen. Thirteen years yes. ago. Yes, in the Rosewood massacre, when the Bryce brothers used their train to sneak it into Rosewood to evacuate uh, black people, uh, they didn't allow any men, only women and girls and no boys over 13 because the view was that if a boy was pubescent he was dangerous and that if that train had been stopped and there were boys over 13 on it then it would endanger the rest of the black people and the two men who owned the train I love my black women but let's remember this is uh this is some of that black uh that uh that uh black male patriarchy and uh a lot of those black male privileges remember that uh that back then uh no sanctuary for us, and today, no sanctuary for Tamir Rice, who died when he was 12. Well, the first lynchings that I knew of in Newberry, at, uh, and the use of that, lynch, that hanging tree that we mentioned, involved the lynching of two black boys who were 12 or 13 years old for stealing a watermelon, which they probably didn't steal. So, just being a child is no protection against being uh, uh, not being lynched. Uh, black children were lynched. But, you know, you touched on something about the Bryce brothers that I do want to mention that should be mentioned. Um, every place that I went, except Okoye, I found evidence of white people, a few, who helped, who did the right thing at the right time, either hid the people that worked for them or that they knew personally. In some instances, rare instances, even white police officers tried to prevent victims from being taken by mobs. So you got to give some um, credit to those few whites who did the right thing in those horrible moments um, because they get lost in history. And in my research in Rosewood, a lot of the white folks who talked to me complained about this. They said, listen, my folks tried to help the black people. My folks hit black people and they could have been killed for doing it. But when that Rosewood movie came out, it looked like all the white people were mob members and out to kill blacks and that simply was not true, it's not fair. And they were correct about that. Well, let me give a suggestion to uh, maybe some white listeners that might catch this on YouTube or any other platform. If you want to help a black person, snitch on a white person for me. And uh, that, that'll, be a great, uh, that'll be a great testament to show me that you're dedicated to countering racism, white supremacy. Uh, on page 119, you quote Ernest Par- Parham, I believe is his name? Parham. Parham, yeah. who said that uh, it was not the more refined whites of Sumner, re- referring to the neighboring county of, uh, I mean, the neighboring town, town of, yeah. uh, Rosewood. of Rosewood, who caused the problems in Rosewood. What do you believe he meant when he used the word refined? And yeah, nobody meant 
What did he mean? He meant that the, the, per, the, the whites who participated in the Rosebud Massacre were the backwoods white people, the poor whites. Mm. It was not the refined whites. But uh, he was wrong about that. Mm. Because their photographs, including the photograph that I have in the front of this book, The Beast in Florida, just to get back to the name of my book. The Beast in Florida, about, a History yes. of Anti-Black Violence by uh, Dr. Uh, Marvin Dunn. Let's get that on Amazon and let's spike his sales. Um, the photograph on the front of this book that shows these lynching victims of the massacre in, the, in, Rose, in the Newberry has photographs of men in business suits. And I had white people that I interviewed who told me who these people were. I have the names of most of these people who are standing around the bodies of these Newberry victims, and they were not poor whites. So Ernest Parham may have been gilding the lily a little bit about who actually participated in, the, in, the, in, the, in that particular event. To quote Neely Fuller again, racism, white supremacy for fun, glory, and material gain. Got to keep that in mind, non-white listeners. And our okay. last question is what? Last question is, Harry T. Moore, mm -hmm. what role did his and his wife uh, death play in uh, a legal context as it relates to uh, the FBI? Harry T. Moore, with the possible exception of Osceola, was the bravest man ever walked in Florida. He was a school teacher in Brevard County on the Florida Space Coast back in the 1930s and the 1940s, became the principal of a black school, and he led the registration of blacks as NAACP members in rural counties, rural areas in Florida. He also criticized white sheriffs for participation or, or covering up lynchings. And uh, eventually, um, Harry T. Moore and his wife were killed when a bomb exploded beneath their home in 1951, Christmas night, probably set off by the Klan. And Harry T. Moore was so well known even outside of Florida because he wrote to the NAACP leadership in Washington and New York. He wrote for black newspapers outside of Florida so people knew who Harry T. Moore was. And his killing, and his wife also died, was of such national importance and was covered so broadly, even in the Soviet Union, that uh, the FBI became involved in pursuing the uh, justice and you know, lynching case for the first time. So that was the legal uh, significance of the Moore lynching. But Harry T. Moore uh, should be recognized as Florida's greatest martyr ever, the greatest martyr and his wife uh, that we can note in terms of resisting uh, anti-black violence in this state. Harry T. Moore and Harriet, and Harriet Moore as well. Yes. All right, I'd like to thank my guest, uh, Dr. Marvin Dunn, author of The Beast of Florida, A History of Anti-Black Violence. Uh, where can we find a book? Uh, do you have any upcoming well, events or anything to promote? Well, this particular book is no longer in, in print, and it's a very expensive book. It costs one hundred twenty-four dollars to get this book on Amazon. So I think it's going to be outside most folks' interest of, of capacity really to just buy this book. But my last book that came out just a couple of years ago is entitled, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, a history of Florida through black eyes. And that's available on Amazon, and it's reasonable, and it covers some of the same material that this book does. So I would encourage people to look for the history of Florida uh, through black eyes on Amazon uh, if, if they don't want to spend $124 for this particular book that we've been talking about today. But both books cover some of the same things. And I, don't, I do have appearances, uh, but not many. I can't cite which, which one is next, but I do uh, speak sometimes at schools and colleges uh, and there's some schedule, and they're on, they're on my Facebook page. So if someone wants to follow me on my Facebook page, that's the best way to tell where I might be speaking or what, what may be coming up next. Just friend me, Mark, Dr. Marvin Dunn, and you'll be able to follow my schedule to the extent that you wish to. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll probably get that in the description about the, the new book and also uh, your uh, Facebook page where people can find you if you have any upcoming events and uh, also to buy your new book. Again, thank you, Dr. Dunn, for your time and uh, inviting me uh, on this rainy day. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed the content, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Stay up to date for more videos by clicking the bell notification icon and following our social media. For any of the people, groups, 
companies or videos that were referenced in this video, don't forget to check the description and or the pinned comment section. The question lane, solving problems through the process of questions and answers.